This general dissolution of the shapes of the essentiality as a whole in their individuality becomes in its content more petulant and bitter insofar as the content has its more serious and necessary meaning. The divine substance unites within itself the meaning of natural and ethical essentiality. As regards the natural element, actual self-consciousness shows in the very fact of employing things of nature for its adornment, for its dwelling, and also in feasting on its sacrificial offering, that it is itself the fate to which the secret is revealed. That is the truth about the essential independence of nature. In the mystery of bread and wine, it appropriates this independence along with the meaning of the inner essence. And in comedy, it is conscious of the irony of this meaning generally. Now, insofar as this meaning contains ethical essentiality, it is partly the nation in its two aspects of the state or demos proper and the individuality of the family. Partly, however, it is a self-conscious, pure knowing or the rational thinking of the universal. This demos, the general mass, which knows itself as lord and ruler and is also aware of being the intelligence and insight which demand respect, is constrained and befooled through the particularity of its actual existence and exhibits the ludicrous contrast between its own opinion of itself and its immediate existence, between its necessity and contingency, its universality and its commonness. If the principle of its individuality separated from the universal makes itself conspicuous in the proper shape of an actual existence and openly usurps and administers the commonwealth to which it is a secret detriment, then there is exposed more immediately the contrast between the universal as a theory and that with which practice is concerned. There is exposed the complete emancipation of the purposes of the immediate individuality from the universal order and the contempt of such an individuality for that order. Paragraph 745 continues Hegel's all too short exposition and examination of comedy as a genre. And we should remind ourselves that he's not attempting to provide a general theory of comedy here. It's situating comedy as you might say the end of the really essential aspects of both epic and tragedy. So comedy is not just a, a genre of drama and a way of relating oneself thereby perhaps to the gods, you know, as, as was done in the festivals of Dionysus. It's actually a dissolution of the religious relation, we could say, within ancient Greece. Comedy is an acid that corrodes and it doesn't just corrode by you know poking fun at the powerful or something like that it's showing how things are we saw in the previous paragraph the actor takes off his mask plays with the mask because he wants to show forth something you know something true something right something genuine et vas rectus right now we're getting to see what happens not just to the gods but to other important powers, you could say. And you notice that Hegel, you know, the second part of the paragraph is concerned with the two sides of what in spirit were the ethical substance, the state, you know, the, the, we've talked about this before, the law of the state or translated here, commonwealth, and then the, the law of the family, right? These, these two powers. And the state is going to be revealed as, in a certain respect, not living up to its own self. Why? Because it has to take on actuality. Actuality can, you know, be very, what should we say? Actuality is the test for Hegel of what an idea, what a notion, what a norm really is. What happens when you put it into actuality? What happens when you strip the mask off of theory and you go to the realm of practice. Uh, 
opposition he's going to talk about in here. But there's more than that going on. There's a really interesting parallel that's taking place. And there's this observation that Hegel is making at the very start that we, we really need to dwell on a bit. So he says, this general dissolution of the shapes of the essentiality as a whole in their individuality becomes in its content more petulant and bitter insofar as the content has its more serious and necessary meaning. Okay, so there, there's a lot going on there just in that little short sentence. The general dissolution, allgemeine Auflösung, the you know, the, the falling apart, the analysis, the uh, corrosion that is happening to, to what? To, we, in the last paragraph, the shapes, the forms were the gods, right? Which were revealed to be mere representations uh, just in imagination, something that we've come to realize in previous paragraphs. Shapes of the essentiality, gestalteten Wesenheit, formed, essentialities, right? And notice that Hegel talks about their individuality, right? So each of the gods is supposed to be an individual. We've discovered that they really aren't. We're already prefiguring what we're going to find out a little bit later and something that Feuerbach, by the way, will take from Hegel and really run with, that these are, we saw this already in the unhappy consciousness though, these are just projections of self-consciousness of a part of itself out there into imaginary land, the whatever we want to call it, of the eternal, the pure, the good, what it is that matters. These representations are not real things. I mean, they could be allegories for real forces the way that the Stoics made them, uh, but we, we're not there yet. And then he's got this, this interesting point, right? The content, let's read this one more time, becomes in its content. So not in its form, in its content. What could its content be? Language, you know, comedy, tragedy, epic. These are all forms of language. We saw that this entire section is about the um, language that goes beyond the other forms of religious language that we saw culminating in the cult, like the oracle or the hymn, right? And instead now we have, um, you know, dramatic and, and uh, imaginary uses of language. And the, the content, the more serious, right? The more, um, you know, seemingly authentic, uh, concerned with important things and necessary, note vendica, right? The more necessary its meaning, its bedeutung, what it's, what it's referring to, the more bitter, bitter, right? And petulant. Um, the more, the more angry, the more resentful, right? The word there that I'm blanking on, it has moot in it, right? The mindset or feeling. Um, in any case, the, whatever we're going to call it, the people who think that the gods matter, the people who think that the divine liturgies matter, that all of these former accorded, almost like absolute belief, uh, they become irritable. They become, bitter is a great word for it, you know, they, they, they don't have any real power left except in language, to condemn, to complain. And is it the gods doing this? No, the gods, we've already understood. The gods don't actually do anything. It's people doing it, right? Okay, so this is a very important set of points, right? Then he talks about the divine substance. The divine substance is not the gods, we're finding out, right? The divine substance, the ethical substance that we saw so centrally in spirit and also in the reason section, the uh, essentiality that we we're trying to grasp in the unhappy consciousness, the divine substance unites within itself, he says, the meaning of natural and ethical essentiality. So that means that there's, there's uh, two sides to this in this divine substance, which is part of what we're looking at in the religion section. 
natural essentiality and ethical essentiality. Here we have this really important contrast that we see between the realm of culture or that of human beings and that of nature. But even nature itself is not going to be solely or purely natural. It's already a nature for human beings as, as we see. How do we know this? Well, let's take a look at the first side, the natural side. It says, as regards the natural element, actual self-consciousness, via voice side, actual, you know, real self-consciousness, shows in the very fact of employing, using, making use of, right? Things of nature. Now, the, the, the things of nature, that's uh, not there in the German. Uh, it's der Selben, right? Um, so making use of the things that belong to it of nature. But it could also be read as making use of those things that fall within its own scope, the scope of actual self-consciousness that exists in a natural world. And this is very interesting. You know, we've got all these great dialectics of self-consciousness. You know, you remember this from the self-consciousness section because it's the most famous thing. The struggle to the death, self-consciousness is desire. Self-consciousness cannot exist without another self-consciousness to which it relates itself. We're struggling for recognition. All that is true, right? That's all there. But here Hegel is being brutally realistic. Self-consciousness doesn't just exist in relation to another self-consciousness. They both exist in relation to a natural world, which even if we live in the midst of a metropolis, we are still part of insofar as it rains upon us, or we use products that were generated ultimately using raw materials. The very fact that we eat that we consume, that we wear, all of these things. You know, even if we say, oh, well, you know, if you live in a purely plastic environment, right? Plastic comes from petroleum or from corn or whatever else you're going to make it from. Sooner or later, we human beings exist in relation to the natural world and not just as consciousness to nature, but as self-consciousness to nature. So we exist as self-consciousness in relation to other self-consciousnesses. We exist as self-consciousness in, in, in relation to those gods that we project. We exist as self-consciousness in relation to the environment, the things of nature. And he gives us some examples of this. This is not an exhaustive list, of course, right? Employing things of nature for its adornment putting things on. I mean, it could be as simple as like, you know, um, finding a coconut shell to cover up your, your junk, right? Um, and it could be anything, you know, up to the very elaborate uh, silk robes, you know, with many, many things embroidered on them, anything in between too. Dying is taking things from the environment and using them for their pigment. We could go on and on and on with analyses of this. What else? Dwelling having a place to actually stay. This is something, I mean, you know, think about uh, anthropology and archaeology. How do we know things about ancient humans? They stayed in places. They created shelters. They created tools that they used not just to, you know, cut up their food or kill their food or harvest their food, but to store their food, to eat their food out of. And then they'd, you know, break it up and leave the pot shards around for us to discover many, many millennia later. Um, so dwelling is, is an important aspect. And then feasting, feasting on its sacrificial offering, the opfer, right? The, the sacrifice itself. Um, he says it, actual self-consciousness shows what? That it is itself the fate, the shikzal, um, discussed in the last paragraph, the fate now, not of the gods, but the fate of nature. The fate to which the secret, the kindness, is revealed. The truth about the essential independence of nature. Now, essential independence, selbst Wesenheit. Is that the best translation for this? I mean, it, it kind of works. Selbst Wesenheit, its own 
essence due to itself, right? Now think about what, how nature presents itself to us. I'm not talking about nature, capital N, like the totality of, of everything. Think about the, as he's going to talk about the grain and the wine, right? Those are determinate things. They're also species beings in the grapes and in the grain itself that's going to be baked into bread. Those are to some degree selbst wesen heiten, aren't they? Um, you know, the, whether we live or die, the grapes continue to exist. If you've ever, you know, wandered around and come across wild grapes, uh, which are, you know, not particularly uh, uh, big and oftentimes quite sour because they haven't been domesticated, changed by us human beings. Now, that, that gets at something, right? The big grapes that we like to eat, you know, and maybe peel or they have seeds, they don't have seeds. We have not just used them, we have modified them. And that's holding even in Hegel's time, and that's holding even in the time of the ancient Greeks, because our transformation of grains and fruits and animals as well, and the natural environment, think about digging irrigation ditches, is how we convert nature to our use, right? Right? So to what degree are natural things actually Zelpswesenheiten? And to what degree are they instead dependent on the actual self-consciousness of humanity? So he says, you know, for example, in the mystery of bread and wine, it appropriates this independence along with the meaning of the inner essence. In comedy, it is conscious of the irony of this meaning generally. So what is Hegel doing here? He's saying we can look at what's going on here, and then we can think about comedy as a way of consuming, making use of, transforming all the things of our culture. So now we turn to the side of the ethical essentiality, right? He says, insofar as this meaning, the meaning of divine substance, contains ethical essentiality, it is, and now Hegel does his typical breakdown. I mean, is this, is this really necessary to do the two sides of it? I, I don't think so. But, you know, Hegel's pretty fixated on this schema. So let's see where he goes with it. We have the side of the state, uh, the Stadt, right? Or the demos proper, the eigentlichen demos. Eigenlichen, yes, proper, um, its own demos, its own ethical uh, people, right? And so he says we got that side, and then we have the individuality of the family. And he's not really going to talk about the individuality, individuality of the family very much at this point. We've already, you know, we've, we've plumbed that a lot in, in the, uh, uh, sp the spirit section. And earlier, even in the religion section, we probably don't need to add anything. What's really interesting here, though, is how what he calls the principle of individuality takes root, what it does in relation to the state. So, again, not, not totally original points here. The state, the side of the state, whether we identify it with you know, the idea of the state or the human law as opposed to the divine law, whatever we're going to look at, there's a, a fundamental problematic here. Who is the state? <laughs> Aristotle actually raised this problem in the politics when he said, um, who is the regime? It's not the same thing as the Constitution. You know, the Constitution of Athens would be, well, it's a democracy and it has this history and it has um, these particular ways of organizing things. What does an archon, you know, a ruler do? How are juries selected? That's all the sort of like, you know, background theory stuff. And then there's the, well, how, who is actually in charge here? Who's doing things? Who got elected this year? What does the jury look like this time? Right? And that is the government or the regime. And not mixing one up for the other, although we have a common tendency to do, do that, is quite important, isn't it? So he goes on and he says, this demos, um, 
the general mass, which knows itself as Lord and ruler, and is also aware of being the intelligence and insight which demand respect, is constrained and befooled through the particularity of its actual existence. So let's, let's focus in on that, right? So uh, we're talking about a, a demos, not just you know a tyrant, not just a um, oligarchical or aristocratic ruling class, but really the the whole people, you know, the ethical people. He, I think, he does have like something like Athens in mind here, and the demos, they're not as smart as they think they are. In a certain sense, because they are public, rationality can have a greater play among them. Aristotle recognized this too, a non-Athenian uh, who was rather distrustful of democracy. He said, well, you know, putting together a bunch of people is likely to, if, so long as they don't degenerate into tyranny, you know, more opportunities for discussion, discussion of things and putting forth, uh, um, you know, your, your best appeals, um, it's, it's sort of like, you know, uh, it's better than to have too many people talking than, than not enough people talking. So the demos manages to befool itself through the particularity of its actual existence. This could mean a lot of things. This could mean, you know, focusing too much on the situation that you're dealing with. It could mean using the demos and its political power to settle scores. But it, there's also something more universal about this. The very fact that somebody is selected to speak for and rule in, in the place of the demos means that the demos is not going to be fully represented, even when it thinks that it is. And he says, it exhibits the ludicrous contrast between its own opinion of itself and its immediate existence. How often is this the case? For our contemporary governments and our, you know, political uh, communities, where we're fooled by the fact that, oh yeah, we elected somebody or somebody's in charge, uh, and we take them as as being like the genuine representative, and not just the, you know, least bad schmuck who happened to blunder their way into being put in charge of things. Uh, and we could say there's so much, not just about uh, political commonwealths, we could say this about educational institutions, we could say this about corporations. You know, if you think that the CEOs are the best and the brightest, man, you haven't spent enough time in, in corporations, because very often they're not, you know. And it's not as if, you know, intelligence and talent just somehow gravitates upward. <laughs> there's often a lot of uh, 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 mischances, we'll say, with that. So he goes on and he says, it's, you know, the ludicrous contrast between its own opinion of itself and its immediate existence. Between what? It's necessity and contingency. We talked about necessity a little bit earlier, didn't we? It's universality and commonness. And then he says, if the principle of its individuality, separated from it, the universal, makes itself conspicuous in the proper shape of an actual existence and openly usurps and administers the commonwealth to which it is a secret detriment. This is, this is a very common thing that happens, right? Somebody gets elected. Oh, I'm going to be a reform candidate. We're going to finally get things back on the right track. We're going to get closer to the ideals. And then they find out just how difficult it is to rule and that, you know, the treasury is kind of empty and things aren't working the way that they're supposed to. And the rich are getting away with a lot of stuff that they're, they're uh, not supposed to. And they're like, oh, man, all right, let's start cracking some heads and making progress. And suddenly everyone's like, Wow, why did we vote for this guy? Uh, he's not representing me, you know. Uh, he's a detriment to the commonwealth. And so it, it goes on, right? He says, if it, if it uh, openly usurps and administers the commonwealth to which it's a secret detriment, then there is exposed more immediately the contrast between the, now I love this, the universal as a theory and that with which practice is concerned. If, if that isn't Hegel's, uh, one aspect of Hegel's political ideas in a nutshell, and ethical and religious, you know, there's theory on the one hand, and theory is really awesome. You got to have theory. And then on the other hand, there's practice. And practice is where Wirklichkeit, reality, happens, and your theory actually gets 
put into practice and test it. And you find out that things aren't quite so straightforward and easy. So he says, there is exposed the complete emancipation of the purposes of the immediate individuality from the universal order and the contempt of such an individuality for that order. There is a kind of cynicism here uh, in, in play on the part of the governors. They're like, wow, you know, now that I'm in, I see how much more complicated things are, but these people who elected me, they don't know what the hell's going on. So I'm going to manage things for their benefit, but also for mine, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I don't have to take them that seriously because they're a bunch of rumdums. They don't actually know what's going on. And, you know, we see this dynamic over and over again. Now, that's where the paragraph ends. You can say, what does this have to do with comedy, which is only mentioned in the middle? Well, in comedy, in, in, now let, let's think about this in two ways. In comedy, as a genre, we can find things like this. And it could be in the state. It also could be in the family. And it could be in other things. People are given some sort of scope to make decisions. They screw them up. People criticize them. You know, we laugh. We, we sometimes, it's a bitter, sardonic laugh, you know. Um, sometimes it's a genuine laugh. Uh, we also have, you know, all of this stuff over here going on uh, as being part of the divine substance. Comedy writ large, so moving away just from the genre, this comedic aspect that we are now exploring is in fact a dissolution, an Auflösung, right? And we're finding it's not just of the essentialities that are the gods, it's also of the natural essentiality when we come to realize nature is what we are making of it. Of course, there's plenty of aspects that are resistant to us, hidden to us, but it's not as if we ever have a primeval nature that you know we're entering into and it's totally untouched. Just by being there as self-consciousness, we're already making it human. And then we've got this ethical essentiality that could be explored in many other ways. Um, it could be about all sorts of other relations, not just that of political or familial. Um, but all of these are subject to this, this kind of dissolution that Hegel is narrating here. 